Okay, um, so it is my pleasure now to introduce uh, Dr. Lado Otrin. Uh, Lado, do you want to share your screen? Great. Yeah. Um, he is coming from the Max Planck Institute for Dynamics and Complex Technical Systems, and he is going to tell us about his research on artificial mitochondria from the bottom up. Please, Lado. Okay, well, thank you very much and happy Easter to everyone. <clears throat> so I conduct the research in a group, um, Electrochemical Energy Conversion, headed by Tanya Vidakovic Koch, which is part of Process System Engineering, headed by Professor Kai Zumacher. And our institute is located in Magdeburg, East Germany. So inside of a Maxim Bio Consortium, uh, we are, um, our task is to provide energy regeneration to the artificial cell. And as you heard from the example for Professor Bodenschatz and some other speakers, pretty much all of the synthetic um, or biomimetic modules require ATP to function. The flagellar movement, ciliar movement, uh, actin polymerization, various metabolic conversions, er everything requires ATP. So if you mimic these functions, um, this ATP price is also mimicked along with it. And, um, in nature, there are many ways to produce ATP, but the yield is much different. And for example, one can see that a cellular respiration being the most efficient um, ATP scheme is much more efficient than some other ones. And it is no surprise actually that most of the modern energy regeneration systems published in recent years can be seen featuring um, enzymes of phosphorylation. So this is either photophosphorylation driven by light or oxidative phosphorylation driven by some um, reducing equivalent, for example, NADH. Um, how does this work? So what is required to mimic these functions? It's actually pretty simple. You can reduce the number of components to the essential ones. So in this case, we need membrane from which we can form vesicles, which enable the formation of gradient, which can then be used to drive ATP synthesis by the ATP synthase. How this gradient is formed um, is a bit more versatile. So basically you need a proton pump. And in the case of oxidative phosphorylation, it's a chemically driven protopump. In the case of light driven systems, it's light driven protopump. And then, of course, you need electron shuttle to transport electrons between these enzymes. And last, uh, you need one of the enzymes to connect to the metabolism or to connect to some other um, biomimetic module. Usually, this is NADH dehydrogenase because NADH is the most common reducing equivalent. So, what exactly are we building? Um, if we look at the enzymatic composition, we are building artificial respiratory chains, our energy module. So the most basic version, um, so the essential components here are the ATP synthase, vesicle, and the proton pump. Um, and then in the next step, we are adding NADA dehydrogenase, which as I mentioned, enables us to connect this module to metabolism. Now we have two options here. One is the uh, integral membrane protein, and the second one is water soluble. And the difference here is that the integral one is another proton pump. So in theory, this should also contribute to a proton gradient and the module should be more active than the water soluble variant. Now, when we connect um, artificial respiratory chain with the metabolic cascade, we call this minimal artificial mitochondria. So the logic is pretty much the same. Instead of the Krebs cycle, we have metabolic cascade instead of the a respiratory chain, we have artificial respiratory chain. And then finally, if you want to have um, the entire finished organelle, we also uh, encapsulate this reaction into the outer compartment, which also contains transporters for the substrates and for the products. Now, there are several challenges connected to the construction of artificial mitochondria, and I will talk about a few of them. So one is that for example, this energy module must be stable for quite a while. Ideally, this should function for a couple of days, a couple of weeks, perhaps, in the context of artificial cell. So one of the things that we must do is increase the functional durability of this module. Another thing is that all these respiratory enzymes are known to produce reactive oxygen species. So that means that if we want to have this stable system, we, we need to stabilize it further because reactive oxygen species would react uh, with, let's say, lipid uh, membrane, which causes the lipidation of enzymes. So basically that means that the enzymes would fall out of the membrane, which deactivates the enzymes and destroys the module. 
Now, the second challenge is that all these enzymes need to be inserted with correct orientation. So orientation definitely matters here. We need them to pump proton stores inside of the vesicle, and then this gradient can be used by ATP synthase to produce ATP on the outside of the vesicles. Mm. And also, of course, all of these copies of the enzyme need to be in the same vesicle at the same time to have the uh, fully functioning artificial respiratory chain. Then the third aspect of this is that we must be able to couple our energy module with other biomimetic modules. So, of course, um, we need to match things like osmolarity, uh, ionic strengths, uh, pH, optimums, and so on. And lastly, we need to provide continu continuous oxygen supply. So the oxidase here is using oxygen as a final electron acceptor. And in the absence of uh, breathing, lungs, uh, and um, bloodstream, this oxygen is not easily replaced. So if you imagine these reactions happening in about, let's say, half a milliliter of volume, oxygen is depleted extremely fast, and then the activity of the module is limited by diffusion. So now the first aspect is how we increase the functional durability and stability. We do, we do this by basically supplementing lipid vesicles with uh, polymer. In our case, this is graph copolymer PDMS GPO to form hybrid vesicles. So um, these vesicles, there are a couple of advantages. One is that the lipids, uh, some of the proteins require specific lipids to function, and then this architecture can accommodate for these requirements. And the second thing is that we notice that uh, once the proteins are inserted in hybrid vesicles, the permeability of the membrane actually decreases, which is extremely beneficial for our case. And then the second option is that we replace lipid membranes entirely by polymer membranes. As you can see from the cryo-EM images, the membrane thickness is basically very, is very similar. The fluidity is very similar. So uh, we postulated that the membrane proteins will behave in a very similar fashion. They will be highly active in these artificial membranes, which so far wasn't the case, for example, in blocopolymer membranes, which are much more stiff. Um, and uh, for example, then we, we checked if actually this polymer is protecting the respiratory enzymes against reactive oxygen species. Here on another cryo-EM image, you can see a lipid membrane, which reacted with ROS. And these indents are actually damaged down to the lipid bilayer. And then on, in the next step, uh, the enzymes will be removed from the membrane and module will be inactive. So what we notice is that if we treated lipid vesicles with, for example, ascorbate or ascorbyl-free radical, almost all activity is lost of respiratory enzymes. Now, if you insert these enzymes in hybrid vesicles, so a blend of polymer and lipid, ascorbate basically has no, um, no effect on the system, while the ascorbyl radical still destroys the activity of the system. But if you insert this in pure polymer vesicles, almost all of the activity is preserved. And now finally, we measure the activity of the energy module after 11 days, and we see that the activity was prolonged in hybrid and polymer vesicles, while the lipid vesicles were completely inactive. So now that we have this module chemically stable and functionally durable, we, we inspected what is actually happening with the membrane proteins. So how active is our system? So how we do that is we use the traditional detergent mediated reconstitution. We prepare solubilization profiles with different detergents, reconstitute membrane proteins with different setups, measure their activity. And basically what we can see is that, for example, the activity of biotrioxidase, the proton pump, was preserved across all the systems but if we reconstitute biotrioxidase and ATP synthase, the ATP synthesis in polymerosomes is only about a third of that in liposomes. So some activity is lost. And the question here was why? So we analyze the reconstitution efficiency, so the insertion efficiency of respiratory enzymes and their orientation when reconstituted with different setups, so different detergents at different detergent concentrations in different vesicles. So without going into too many details here, what basically we can conclude from this, this is a comparison of the reconstitution parameters for biotrioxidase and the ATP synthase. And what we can see is that the optimal reconstitution for one of the enzymes in one of the systems is definitely much different than for the other enzyme and also between the systems. So there, there isn't a single optimal reconstitution protocol and what some of the function must always be sacrificed uh, if one is intending to reconstitute more than one transmembrane protein. 
if if we think about this, that that is actually expected because only one setup really, one configuration of these enzymes will lead to very active system. Some will lead to some activity. So basically we have two proton pumps and one is pumping in one direction and another in the opposite direction. The net proton flux may still be enough to drive the ATP synthesis, but the ATP synthesis will be impeded. But the most outcomes are negative. So there is no ATP synthesis. So we are trying to find a way around it. And since we know that we can optimally reconstitute a single membrane protein, we were thinking, okay, well, we can optimally reconstitute single proteins, co-reconstitute snare, fusogenic proteins, and then fuse this system to form basically a system with ideal configuration. So what we did here is exactly that. So we reconstituted the ATP synthase optimally with one half of the snare pair. We reconstituted butyrioxidase with another. We fused the system and measured the ATP production. And remarkably, basically, what we saw is that if you compare then the final activity of the system in lipid, hybrid, and polymer vesicles, not only that now we can match the activity in hybrids and polymerosomes to the activity of liposomes, but we can even surpass it in polymerosomes because polymerosomes fuse more efficiently. So the second thing is that how can we facilitate coupling with other modules? And one of the things that we must be careful about is osmotic stress. So again, we, we are trying to measure here how our um, what the activity of our energy module is under different uh, osmotic stress conditions. So here we see the size of the artificial respiratory chain vesicles uh, measured by DLS. And when we would induce um, hypertonic stress, the vesicles would shrink, but the activity is nevertheless preserved. Now the other part is more problematic. So what happens when the vesicles swell? So again, we see drastic swelling when we induce hypotonic stress of six, 600 milliosmolar difference. But even though the vesicles are drastically expanded, they're still active, so they do not burst. Uh, so towards this end, we stabilized them in high sucrose solution and added some other stabilizers. So this means that we can couple this module with dynamic modules, so with another module with, which has dynamic range of at least 600 milliosmoles per kilogram. So now to the example of the actual coupling. Um, so here we couple the, our metabolic cascade, which is catch cycle published by the group of TBSR. Uh, this is um, carbon fixation pathway uh, comprising 17 enzymes from nine different organisms. And the idea here is that the format, a simple organic molecule would be used as a sole source of carbon and energy source. So, there is one ATP dependent reaction. Our, um, our artificial respiratory chain here is energized by, by formate, which is converted to NADH and fed to the respiratory chain, which produces ATP, which is then using this one reaction. And um, what we saw is that um, at the beginning, the activity of the catch was pretty much the same to the controls, but then it, it decreases a little bit and the overall efficiency is about 30%. So we wanted to check whether this, the problem arises from this ATP dependent step, or it might be just some other problem due to the um, interactions of vesicles with uh, this enzymatic cascade. And indeed, we saw the accumulation of 4-hydroxybutyrate, which is a subset of this ATP dependent reaction. So we saw that the ATP was insufficient in the system. Now we are looking into this and what we did is we measured the ATP production by the artificial respiratory chain over two hours. Like that was the, the runtime of this coupled reaction. And what we saw is that the beginning, at the beginning, the ATP synthesis was extremely high. And then this dropped. And, this, um, and then in the next uh, couple of hours, the ATP synthesis was much slower. So we saw that something was happening with the module there. And when we measure the oxygen concentration in the system, basically we saw that the module is so active that the oxidase in the system is depleting oxygen in less than four minutes. So what we did is we wanted to design some backup, some auxiliary um, oxygen regeneration system, which would oxygenate this reaction sufficiently to drive this coupled reaction. And towards this end, we use calcium peroxide particles, which are dissolved in water. Uh, they release oxygen. But at the, P at the operational pH, they also uh, released hydrogen peroxide, which we then couple to catalase 
uh, that converts the hydrogen peroxide to oxygen and water. So this reaction shows just uh, the oxygen release by these uh, particles. Uh, so this is the oxygen release without catalase and with catalase. We saw that with catalase, basically, we saturate um, the water solution. And indeed, when we added these particles to the artificial respiratory chain, we drastically increase this fast uh, ATP synthesis rate uh, for several minutes. So now just quickly, what are some next steps, what we would like to do uh, with the system? One of the things we want to make most of these steps automatic. So we would like to express these membrane proteins cell-free in microfluidic setup, fuse the system or assemble it through fusion. And then also add another, uh, so other biomimetic modules to form fully functional synthetic cells. So the other thing we would like to do is complete the actual mitochondria. So now we have the coupled reaction and the artificial respiratory chain. And what we are working on now is encapsulating this module in the outer compartment and controlling the, the, the substrate and um, the product exchange. And lastly, we would like to attach these vesicles to the scaffold, which um, contains fibers uh, with embedded calcium peroxide particles. This um, artificial scaffold would release oxygen and oxygenate our module. And with this scaffold, we can also attach the respiratory tissue to let's say reactors and use it in a bioproduction facilities. So with that, I would like to take, uh, thank our collaborators and you for attention. Thank you. Thank you very much. A lot of uh, fascinating uh, work, uh, very, very systematic. Um, again, I'd like to um, invite people to submit questions on the q and I am not seeing any questions so far. Um, Here's one um, from Jacqueline Delora. She says, uh, have you thought about developing a synthetic system that uses, for example, nitrogen rather than oxygen as an input? Would this be experimentally feasible? Uh, definitely. So my personal ambition here is to go more into, uh, let's say, space science with this and to add some metabolism that is not so biologically relevant maybe, but it's more relevant to extreme environments. So with respect to this, whatever we can uh, fed to the artificial respiratory chain, we can uh, use it to drive the respiratory chain. So I think that uh, this would be possible, yeah. Great, uh, thank you, very, very interesting. Um, another question here. Um, um, Felipe Quiroz is asking, uh, could you comment a bit on where you are now with regards to ATP slash energy output and the needed scale up to match the energy demands of a minimal artificial cell? Yes, absolutely. So uh, what we are reaching with artificial mitochondria is up to a few millimolar range, which basically means that we can drive any physiological reactions with this. So the catch cycle alone is, um, I think it's, it's high micromolar range, about 600, which we can drive. Um, basically we can drive most biological reactions. I think all of them that I saw so far, which have clearly stated um, the ATP requirements. Uh, just to follow up, have you um, compared, for example, um, um, your, production capability for ATP to that of say the, you know, the Craig Venter uh, minimal cell that we heard about last week. Uh, could you please remind me what was their output? Oh, I, I don't know what it, what it is. It's just, you know, it's their, their minimal genome cell that they, you know, that they built. Yeah, um, I don't remember, sorry. Okay, okay thank you. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, here's another question from, uh, Idira Macias, uh, very interesting talk. If I understood correctly, no microfluidics experiments have been performed. I have read some papers where various modules, modules have been integrated together, including the mitochondria to generate ATP. What makes mm. your system different? So basically in this one or two systems, this is published by our um, 
collaborators, so Professor Erb, they used um, either isolated mitochondria or isolated chloroplasts. So what we do is we created the system bottom up, so and we can tune the composition exactly as we would like it uh, to be. This is the difference, and the difference is also that we can build more stable system, and at some point we are hoping to build more efficient system by reducing uh, the redundancy and by controlling the protein orientation better. So uh, the, the, the person who asked the question was correct. Uh, we, we haven't done anything in microfluidics so far. So at least I personally haven't done it, but our collaborators, so the group of Tom Robinson, um, and also one of the, my colleagues uh, tried to encapsulate part of the catch reaction, which uh, was done successfully. Uh, so we are quite optimistic that we can uh, assemble the mitochondria in microfluidics in the next, next half a year or so. Thank you. Uh, Mario Mencia asks, uh, was, he comments, excellent work. Uh, he's, he, Thank you. he asks, I didn't get why the coupled AD, ATP yield was higher in the liposomes than in the polymerosomes. Did you actually observe different orientations in both systems? Yes, yes. So we observed not only different orientations, but the main issue here is the um, reconstitution efficiency. So the insertion efficiency of ATP synthase so just a second. So for example, if you compare the ATP synthase insertion in liposomes, the most active system is the one um, constructed with sodium collate that is mediating detergent. And if you compare this activity to the most active system in polymerosomes constructed with OG, we saw it's about 40%. So since only 40% of the ATP synthase in polymerosomes is ending up in membranes compared to liposomes, the overall activity is also much lower. So this is what we're trying to increase now or that we increased by uh, using fusion to assemble the system instead of core reconstitutions. Thank you. Um, Susie Atlas asks, well, she comments as well, very impressive work. She asks, since this is such a complex system with many moving parts, have you encountered any unexpected consequences in this system that required significant efforts, efforts for mitigation or which suggests new avenues for synthetic engineering? Yes, I think that <laughs> every step of the way was pretty painful <laughs> and full of challenges. <laughs> so one of the things is definitely uh, how to control this orientation. That's why we switched to fusion. One must understand that the fusion of polymer vesicles is basically, it's very limited because they're so rigid and so inert and they're like five, six example of polymerosome fusion and no example of lipids or, um, of, um, of lip, uh, protein mediated uh, polymer fusion. So we did it for the first time and we had to figure out how to reconstitute membrane proteins along with snare proteins. We also uh, spent a lot of time on creating the oxygen regeneration system. This is also not so straightforward because um, the particles need to be distributed quite evenly to oxygenate solution evenly. And uh, since uh, they are not coated, they also release oxygen pretty fast. That's why we would like to embed them into fibers to have the control oxygen release at the control rate, kind of like respiration. Um, and of course, the, the construction alone. So when we are adding new enzymes to the artificial respiratory chain, the complexity increases exponentially. So it's not the same thing to add third enzyme than it is to add second enzyme just in a nutshell, but there are of course many different challenges. Okay, um, let's see. Azam Golami asks in slide 12, why do you observe drop in ATP concentration after eight minutes, even with enough oxygen? Um, uh, basically in this coupled system, so in, in this case, if she's referring to this case, uh, we haven't added catalase uh, because, because of the background um, in uh, luminescence measurements. So that's why also the, the whole signal is more noisy uh, because the peroxide is killing the enzymes. So I think that this drop that we observed is combination of enzymes slowly dying. And also the second part is that uh, concentration of particles that was added was so minuscule to still enable these light based measurements that uh, the oxygen is released much faster than let's say in these experiments when much more particles were added. Okay, um, and um, final question 
um, somewhat related from Felipe Quiroz. What do you know about how the polymerisomes prevent reactive oxygen species induced damage to the key arc components? Mm -hmm. uh, so basically, um, we believe that it's mainly due to uh, prevention of the lipidation. So the polymer membranes remain more, more or less intact. So that means that the integrated enzymes are also protected from the ROS and also they don't get ejected from the membrane. Uh, we tried treating just uh, just proteins, so just enzymes with reactive oxygen species, and we saw that they're also deactivated. So it means that um, the thickness of the membrane alone is enough to protect them partially, but mostly is due to the lack of the lipidation. Okay, well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Lado, for a, a great talk, and uh, thank, thank you. you. Thank you also, uh, Eberhard, uh, Dr. Bodenschatz, for um, wonderful talk. Um, I am going to now introduce the, the um, talks that we'll have next week, if I can get pick, pull up the right slide. Uh, let's see here. For some reason, yeah, this is the right slide. You should be seeing a slide uh, that uh, indicates that next week we will be hearing from Professor Felipe Garcia Quiroz. He's from uh, Emory, Emory University in Georgia Tech, and he'll be talking about membraneless stimuli and stimuli responsive organelles. Uh, he's been very active in the um, in the question and answers sessions that we've had. So appreciate that uh, him bringing his insights, and we get to hear about his um, his his uh, interesting work next week. We will also hear from Cesar Rodriguez Emenegger uh, from Liebitz Institute for Interactive Materials on super selectivity in synthetic protocells. So uh, thank you all very much for attending and um, we look forward to um, more discussion uh, next Monday, April 12th.